This is the lecture for section 10A, Fundamentals of Geometry. In geometry, we have different things like points, lines, and planes. A geometric point is imaged to have zero size. Basically meaning it has no dimension, it's literally just showing us a location. A geometric line is formed by connecting two points along the shortest path possible. So it will be straight, going through and extending in both directions. Line segments are pieces of a line. That means they have a specific start and an end. So if this was point A and this was point B, if I drew it like this, A, B would be a line. If I did A, B like this, it would be called a segment. And then we also have a geometric plane and it's gonna be a perfectly flat surface and it's gonna have two dimensions, length and width. So zero dimension, this has one dimension. It's going to extend forever and ever in one direction. And this has two dimensions. It's got forever and ever length and width. The dimension of an object can be thought of as the number of independent directions in which you could move if you were the object. So really another way to think about that is coordinates. And the coordinates of a point tell us exactly where it is located. So this first one here is three units to the right of zero. This point here, two, three, is a two dimensional coordinate. It gives me an X value followed by a Y value. The X value is two and the Y value is up at three. And there is such a thing as three coordinate grids that I could graph an X, a Y, and a Z, and this would be in three dimensional space. And this one has an X value of one, a Y value of two, and a Z value of three. At this point, I know some of you are probably thinking, oh boy, we're back in high school geometry and maybe I didn't do so good. Just to know, right now, all we're doing is looking at some definitions and things. I'm not going to test you on remembering how to label points and lines and planes or anything like that. So don't worry. Relax. I got gotcha. you. Next thing that we talk about in geometry, though, is angles. And an angle is an intersection of two lines or two line segments. So usually we think of it if I have two line segments here and they meet at a point, this creates an angle. And the point of intersection is called the vertex. The different angles that we can talk about in math, we have a right angle, which measures 90 degrees. And please know that your right angle can face any direction and a lot of times it represents, there's a box in the corner to represent that it's a perfect right angle or 90 degrees. So you can see that right angle faced any way. It doesn't always have to be pointing to the right. We have a straight angle, which is also known as a straight line. A straight line measures 180 degrees. An acute angle is one that measures less than 90. An obtuse angle is one that measures between 90 and 180. So it's gotta be a little bigger than 90 but it cannot equal 180. One thing we can do is talk about some angles that could be found in a circle. When we think about a circle, an entire rotation around a circle is called 360 degrees. So we can find the degree of certain parts of the circle based on that fact. We were going to find the degrees of a semicircle, a quarter of a circle, an eighth of a circle, and a one hundredth of a circle. So here's what we do. If we want to find half a circle's angle measure. You take half, which is the fraction, times by your entire circle, 360 degrees, and get 180. I'm going to repeat this process with the remaining fractions on the next slide.
So next is a quarter circle. Well, a quarter is one fourth or one over four. And if we times that by 360, the entire circle, a quarter of a circle is 90 degrees. And that should make sense here because if I make my circle here and I cut it into four equal pieces, you should see that I make four 90 degree angles in the middle. An eighth of a circle, so one eighth means one over eight, times 360 gives me 45 degrees. So what I've done is I've taken this and split them all in half, and half of 90 is 45. Last one here, if we want a hundredth of a circle, a hundredth is one over 100 times by 360, 3.6 degrees. So I can do this for any fraction, any way that I want to do that. I could also ask you the opposite question. I could say, what fraction is a 20 degree angle in a circle? Well, if I want to go backwards to the fraction, I need to take my 20 degrees and put it over my 360 degrees. So let's think that through. 20 over 360, I can divide them both by 10. That makes two out of 36. And they're both still even, so I can divide them by two now. That is 1 18th of a circle represents 20 degrees. So you can always go both ways. Some more definitions here of just parts of a circle, because we need that if we're going to work with area or some formulas we're going to do on the next few slides. In a circle, we have three, point, three pieces that we need to work with. The first is the center, so the point in the very middle of your circle. The radius is going to go from the center out in one direction. The diameter goes through the circle from one end to the other through the center. So one thing that we know is a diameter is equal to two radii or a radius is half of the diameter. So if I know that the diameter of my circle is 10, then the radius must be five because two parts of five make my 10. We're also gonna talk about some of our other shapes here called polygons. A polygon is any closed shape in the plane made from straight lines. So think any shape that you can make with straight lines can be a polygon. That's a polygon. Um, this is a polygon. Now, usually though, these are not what you think of when you think of polygons or your normal shapes. You probably think of this, which is called a regular polygon. And a regular polygon is the shapes that you learned back in grade school, back in kindergarten, first grade even. These shapes have all sides that are equal and all their angles are also equal. So we create the triangle, the triangle with all three sides exactly the same. The square is the four-sided shape with all four sides the same. The pentagon with all five the same. The hexagon, six-sided shape. Octagon is your stop sign, eight-sided shape. A decagon has 10 sides. There's other ones in there. We've got a heptagon, which would be seven. Nonagon would be nine. There's other ones. Um, 12 is a dodecagon, but you don't need to know those. Just remember your basic shapes, triangles, squares, pentagons, hexagons, octagons, okay? So triangles are among the most important of all of our polygons, and they can take on different shapes and forms, as we're going to see here. They don't all have to have that perfect shape of all three sides being the same, like a regular polygon. We can also have isosceles triangles here. So isosceles means that two of the sides are the same. And what we have here is this one's an obtuse because this one's got a big angle up top. 
and then the second one's an acute isosceles triangle. We can also have right triangles. I could also actually have an, a right isosceles. So I could do this, a right angle, two sides the same. Um, down here, I've got right triangles. So they've got the right angle. So there's lots of different ways that we can pair these together. They don't always have to look like this first one here, and they can have acute, obtuse, or right angles, and any number of sides the same. If you were to take some time and maybe sketch some different triangles and maybe add all of the angles together here, or you just remember from geometry class, however long ago that was for you, a triangle, if you add all three of the angles together, you're going to get 180 degrees. So it doesn't matter what size your triangle is, if it has an obtuse or right, uh, all acute angles, no matter what you do in order to construct that triangle, all the angles will equal sum together 180. So why do we learn about all these shapes? Well, we are going to go back and discuss perimeter and area. And you may think, oh boy, why am I doing this? Well, these are things, again, just like the finance questions and some of the statistics things, these are things that you can use in your real world. If you have to decide how much paint to buy for a room or the size of carpet that you need, that is using area. If you want to put a fence around your yard, that is using perimeter. So these are concepts that are real world concepts. So let's review what each of them are. Perimeter is simply the length around the outside of an object or the length of its boundary. And usually the way we find our perimeter is we just add all around the outside. So whatever shape you have, it can be any shape, size, whatever. You're just going to add all the sides around together. Do know that a circle has a special name for its perimeter, which is called circumference. The area then is how much space is taken up here. I want to know how much space is within the confines of this, the boundaries. And we have formulas for a few different shapes that we're going to use here. You don't ever have to have them memorized, so feel free if you want to make a little note card with your formulas on it when you're doing your homework or test. I would suggest you do that. We have five different shapes here that we're going to work with. We have the circle. Perimeter, is also called circumference, is 2 times pi times the radius. Knowing for pi, I will just leave the pi symbol, but if you want the number form for it, it's 3.14. Area is pi r squared. For a square, we have four sides that are all the same, l plus l plus l plus l. It's going to be 4l. And area is going to be length times width, so l times l, or l squared. A rectangle is going to be similar, except that not all the sides are the same. I'm going to have two lengths and two widths. So the perimeter is two lengths plus two widths. The area is length times width. A parallelogram, again, has two lengths and two widths, but it's slanted. So the perimeter is still two lengths and two widths. The area is the length times the height. Now, sometimes you'll see the height outside here. Sometimes you'll see the height drawn inside to a 90 degree angle. The way you know the difference is area is what's inside here using the height and the perimeter is what's on the outside using the width. A triangle will have three sides. You would just add the three sides together for the perimeter and its area is one half base times height. Let's take a look at this window. This window has a four foot by six foot rectangle and it's capped then by a semicircle. How much trim is needed to go around the window? 
So if we're thinking around the window, we are thinking around the outside, which is related to perimeter. Now, this is going to be, this is a little bit more of a difficult problem here. It's not just your basic shape. We've combined two shapes together. So here's what I see. I've got four feet on the bottom, six feet up the sides, and six feet up the sides. That's the easy part. The tricky part then comes with this half circle up here. So you can see here, we start with a four plus four plus six. I know I need 16 feet for those straight pieces. Now we need to figure out that semicircle. Well, half a circle means I'm going to take half the perimeter of the circle. And that is one half times the perimeter of the circle is two pi r. So what that means is I can take one half times two times pi times r. So if I take one half times two times pi, 3.14, times my radius here is two. Half times two is one. One times 3.14 is 3.14, times by two is six point, it ends up being 6.28, which rounds to 6.3 feet. So add that to the 16 we've already got, a total of 22.3 feet of wood is gonna be needed for that trim. Let's find some area and perimeter of some other shapes here. We have a square state park with sides eight miles. So I have a square, all sides are eight. Perimeter, all the sides are eight. There are four sides that are eight miles long. So four times eight is gonna give me 32 miles around the outside of my state park. If I wanna find the area, I'm gonna take length times width. Well, it is eight miles long by eight miles high, wide, and that's gonna give me 64 miles squared. And one thing you're gonna notice is perimeter is always in your unit and area is always units squared. A rectangular envelope, we have four inches on one side and eight inches on the other side. So if I wanna find the perimeter, I've got two fours and then I have two eights. So the two fours, that makes eight, the two eights make 16, and eight plus 16 is gonna give me 24 inches around the outside. The area is four units by eight units, which we already know four times eight is 32, and this one's gonna be inches squared. Now we have a parallelogram. We have sides eight and 30 and a distance of four feet between the 30 foot sides. So that means the height inside here is four. Starting with perimeter on the outside, I've got two eights, so I could write it like this, eight plus eight, and then two thirties, the top and bottom, 30 plus 30. And that's gonna make 76 feet around the outside of my parallelogram. The area is the base of 30 times the height on the inside of four, and 30 times four is 120 feet squared. Another place you will use this is if you do any form of construction. You've built a stairway in a new house and want to cover the space beneath the stairs with plywood. What is the area of this region? So we see here that the stairway under here, this plywood is going to be the shape of a triangle. The base is 12 feet, the height is nine feet. So if we're gonna do a triangle, area is one half base times height, one half times 12 times nine. So half times 12 is six and six times nine is 54 square feet. Now let's take a look at the city park. The following figure shows a city park in the shape of a parallelogram with a rectangular playground in the center. If all but the playground is covered in grass, 
what area is covered in grass? Well, we have two different shapes that we need to worry about here. So let's talk with the parallelogram. So the area of the parallelogram, well, the parallelogram's base is 90 meters. Its height has to come from this 90 degree out here. So 60 meters. 90 meters times 60 meters is 5,400 meters squared. So the entire park is 5,400 square meters. But what happens is now I have this playground in the middle that I don't want grass in. So let's look at that. The playground is the shape of a rectangle with a length of 55 meters and a height of 20 meters. So if I want to find the area of that, I'm going to multiply them and I get 1,100 square meters. Now comes the final step. If I know my entire park is 5,400 meters squared, and I don't want this part, the playground part, to have grass, I want to take away that 1,100 square meters. So the grassy area is going to be 5,400 meters squared minus 1,100 meters squared for a total of 4,300 meters squared. We also have three-dimensional shapes that we work with or see in our everyday life. The most important ones are clearly going to be boxes and spheres. And we're also going to talk about one other shape, which is a cylinder. So if you ever buy a canned good, and we're going to talk about their formulas, which we have what's called the surface area and the volume. And we'll see those formulas on the next slide. We have four shapes that we're going to work with here. The sphere, the cube, the rectangular prism, also known as a box, and the regular cylinder. The surface area is always going to be in square units because area always has two dimensions. Volume is going to be in units cubed because it's taking up space three dimensions. So sphere's surface area is 4 times pi times r squared. Its volume is 4 thirds pi r cubed. A cube has a surface area of 6 l squared and the volume is l cubed. A box has a surface area of 2 times the quantity, length times width, plus length times height, plus width times height, and a volume of length times width times height. And then our right cylinder here has a surface area of 2 pi r squared plus 2 pi r h, and a volume of pi r squared h. Again, you do not ever need to memorize these formulas. You just need to refer back to them and be able to use them. A water reservoir has a rectangular base that measures 30 meters by 40 meters. I'm going to draw this out here. So we've got a base that's 30 by 40 and vertical walls that are 15 meters high. So if I draw these 15 meter high walls, I can make my box here. So 40 by 30 by 15. It was filled to capacity. At the end of the summer, the water depth was four meters. How much water was used? Well, let's figure out how much can hold first. Well, our starting value, 30 meters by 40 meters by 15 meters is 18,000 cubic meters. What happens is they've pulled water out of here throughout the entire year. And at the end of the season, all we have left, let me kind of draw that as best as I can here, is four meters high of water. Well, let's see what we got. The area, the volume of that 40 by 30 by four is 4,800 meters cubed. So we can figure out how much is used by just subtracting these two values together. So the city or whatever, um, whoever was using the water reservoir used 13,200 cubic meters of water.
Let's look at oil drums. Which holds more, an oil drum with a radius of two feet and a height of three feet? So let me draw this here. A radius of two and a height of three, or an oil drum over here with a radius of three feet and a height of two feet. The oil drums are cylinders. So we want to know how much they hold inside of them. So we're gonna talk about their volume. The volume of a cylinder is pi times r squared times h. So let's fill in what we got. Pi is 3.14. The radius is two, which we're gonna square. And then three is the height. So you're just gonna go to a calculator and type 3.14 times two squared times three. And you're gonna get about 37.7 cubic feet. Let's look at this guy over here. So again, volume equals pi r squared h, so 3.14. Radius is three squared, and then we're gonna times by two. If you go to a calculator for this one, you're going to get 56.5 feet cubed. So this one is clearly larger than the first one. Last thing we're gonna talk about here are scaling laws. So what happens is sometimes we have a scale model to represent the real object, which you guys looked at for the um, solar system. That was a scale model. And I think it was like one millionth or one billionth. I can't remember what the size difference was to be able to see the entire um, planets that are in our solar system. So we are gonna have scale factors for lengths. And then also there's scale factors for areas and volumes and they use that in that solar system. So what we know is if I know that two things have a scale factor of let's say four to seven, let's, there's length scale factor. The area of this first piece is gonna be 16. The area of the second piece is gonna be 49. This is, their, this is their area scale factor. So areas are going to be squared scale factors, which means volumes are going to be the cube of the scale factor. So if we wanna find the size difference between the volumes, we do their cubes. So four cubed is 64 and seven cubed is 343. So four squared to seven squared, and this was four cubed to seven cubed. So if you know their original scaling factor, you can figure out their area scale factor and their volume scale factor. Here's an example of a model car. So the actual car has dimensions here of the six foot by five foot by four foot. And what they did is they made a model car by the scale factor of 10. So that means the height, length, and width now are six tenths of a foot, five tenths of a foot, and four tenths of a foot. Let's look at the scale factor when it comes to the roof area. Well, we know the actual roof area is gonna be found by taking the length times the width. So what I would have is I would have six times five. But that's also, if I wanted to do that with the model, it's 10 times the model roof and 10 times the model roof width and length. So that would be 10 times the model roof, which is six tenths and 10 times this guy, five tenths. So we see here that 10 squared, that scale factor of 10, actually one to 10, has made the area here be 100 times larger in the actual compared to the model. 
So I can see that here if I actually did the workout. 6 times 5 is 30 square feet. If I did the model here, 6 tenths times 5 tenths gives me 31 hundredths. So this is 100 times smaller because it's being divided by 100. And the same thing is going to happen with the volume because the actual length is 10 times the model length and the width is 10 times the model width, and the height is 10 times the model height. In the end, your volume, your actual volume is a thousand times the model volume. So again, that scale factor is gonna work there. So for area, it's one to 100, and volume, in this case, is now one to 1,000. The surface area to volume ratio for any object is its surface area divided by its volume. Larger objects have a smaller surface area to volume ratio than similarly proportioned smaller objects. And smaller objects have a larger surface area to volume ratio than similarly proportionally small objects. Using that concept, let's say you have a few ice cubes you want to cool your drink quickly. Should you crush the ice before you put it in the drink? Why or why not? Well, based on the last slide, the drink is going to be cooled by more surface area. The larger the surface area of the ice, the quicker it's going to cool because smaller objects have a larger surface area to volume ratio, the crushed ice is going to have more surface area. And if it has more surface area, then your drink is going to cool faster.